Hi, folks. Welcome to the session on Trove. Um, wanted to start this session off by telling you guys a short story. Um, so a couple of years ago, um, I was uh, uh, working on developing a new application. Uh, I was working for a big company. And um, as most applications, this one, too, had some data requirements. And so we needed a database for um, uh, as a place to store the data. And as every big company, we had a dedicated IT team. And so I sort of shot off an email to the IT saying this was the sort of data we needed to store in the database. And got back another email from them with a Word doc with, that was three pages long, asking me to explain what sort of data requirements we had, what sort of backups we would need, things like that. Um, and it, it literally took me a day and a half to fill up the Word doc and send it back to them. So where I'm getting at, let, let, let me tell you about Trove. Um, I, my name is Nikhil Manchanda, and uh, I'm the PTL for Trove. And I'll be co-presenting this with Amrit, and I'll let Amrit introduce himself. Hi, my name is Amrit. I'm uh, one of the founders of a company called Tesora, and we focus on Trove, and we work only on Trove for OpenStack. Uh, so we're going to give you a sort of overview of uh, Trove, its architecture, uh, follow it up with a short, a short demo uh, showing you some of what Trove can do, uh, and also sort of finish up with what we have in Juno and what we're looking to implement in Kilo. So uh, let's get started. Um, Amrit will sort of carry on the first part of the presentation, and we'll talk about Trove and uh, its mission statement and architecture. So I'll hand off to him. Thanks, Nikhil. OK. Um, I hope you guys are able to hear me OK in the back. OK. Um, like Nikhil, I've spoken with many companies which have tried to deploy a database-driven application. And one of the major pain points which people talk about is that it takes sometimes months to get an IT organization to provision a database. So we'll show you how Trove can change that. Um, just to set our expectations, how many of you here are using OpenStack already in some form? How many of you are using a database in OpenStack? How many of you have considered Trove? How many of you have tried it? OK, you notice that number keeps coming down. Hopefully, by the end of this presentation, more of you will want to try Trove, OK? Um, my contact information is here. It's also on the last slide. We will be making these slides available. There's copious notes pages on the slide, so you should be able to use them as reference material later as well. And by the way, if you guys are tweeting about this, some hashtags for you. Oh, OK. Now it works. Ooh, forgive the aspect ratio here. but So what is Trove? Trove, by its own mission statement, aims to make it easy for you to provision, operate, manage databases in the OpenStack environment. Connect. Oops. OK. Um, and, and the goal is to make this easy for people who are using OpenStack to provision and operate a scalable database framework. That's all that Trove does. A lot of times, people get confused when understanding about Trove. So I want to spend a couple of minutes on this picture here. Shown in the middle here is a database. It could be relational. It could be non-relational. It could be any database. And on top is your application. Trove sits below the database, and it's only interested in things which we call the management and provisioning plane. We provision databases. We do some amount of administration, some amount of management. Trove, by default, does not touch your data, does not execute queries, does not get into the data plane. That's what your application does. So your application creates tables or collections, creates indexes, things like that. It queries the data. It inserts data. Trove doesn't do any of that, with one small exception. When we do backup and restore, we touch your data. With the exception of that, Trove only does provisioning, management, and things of that nature. With that very broad distinction, it's very important to understand. Trove operates in the provisioning plane. Apps operate in the data plane. OK? And stop me anyway, any point if you have questions, all right? OK, so I like pictures. Um, 
Everybody has gone to a Coke machine at one point or another. Nikhil had to fill a three-page document. Nobody will fill a three-page document to get a can of Coke. You go up to a machine, you press a button, you get a bottle of Coke. Trove is very similar to that, with a small exception with the little plus plus at the end. So think about a machine, which if you walk up to and you press a button, there's a button there which says MySQL, somewhere in the middle. Um, you press the button, and the machine's going to hand you a fully provisioned uh, MySQL instance. And the plus plus says it'll also manage it for you. It'll take backups for you. It will do replication for you. It'll maintain a replication slave and make sure that you have a highly available uh, master slave network. This is what Trove does. And it does it for a bunch of different databases. You could do a clustered Mongo deployment with Trove. So you have OpenStack installed, you have Trove, and you can click a button and say, Trove, give me a clustered Mongo instance, and it'll go off and do that for you. That's basically what Trove does. It makes it easy for you to not have to fill the form which Nikhil had to fill, and instead, when you need it, you get yourself a database instance. That's basically what Trove does. And Trove is a layer, is a OpenStack uh, project up there. Um, I'm sorry about how the pictures came out, but now <coughs> you notice, uh, I hope that's not going to screw up your demo. Um, Trove is a, is a project which relies on the other core OpenStack projects. Okay? Uh, Nova, Cinder, Swift, Neutron, Glance, and uh, Keystone depicted here. Um, all, of this, all of the core OpenStack services or OpenStack projects are used by Trove in order to give you the database as a service. Trove exposes an API. You can program against the Trove API. And Trove uses only the standard documented APIs of these services. Okay? So if you already have a deployment of OpenStack, you deploy Trove on top of OpenStack, and that's it. Any questions? I'm going to pause and see if anybody has any questions at this stage. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more in, in depth about how Trove works. Um, I hope folks at the back of the room are able to make out the, the lettering on the slide. But the color code is approximately as follows. The stuff on the left in green is things which relate to Trove. The stuff on the right are the other OpenStack projects we talked about. Um, Keystone and networking all the way at the very end. Um, Glance, where we store images. Swift. Cinder, and Nova. And on the left-hand side, we have Trove. And you notice there's this little overlap in the middle. Those are places where Trove has interactions with the specific underlying project. So let's talk about a life cycle of a simple instance. User comes along and says, give me a Trove instance. Comes into the Trove API. The Trove API is going to do something. Trove's going to do something. But at the end of the day, an image gets picked up from Glance. That image is given to Nova. And Nova spins up one of those compute instances. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that instance is. But that is the database instance you requested. So you hit the button and you say you want a MySQL instance. An image for MySQL is loaded into Nova, executed. The connection endpoint is handed to you. That IP address, port 3306, for example, that's your MySQL database. Okay. Um, you could also go hit a button on Horizon Console or with the CLI and say, do a backup of a database for me. You created a database like this, do a backup. That backup gets sent off to uh, Swift and it's stored on Swift. You could at a later point in time come along and say, I took a backup the other day. Give me a new MySQL instance based on that backup. In that case, we're going to take the backup off of Swift, load it onto your instance, hand you the connection endpoint, that's your queryable database. So there's a certain amount of automation built on top of these services. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about each of these because Nikhil's going to be showing you a demo. But at a, at a high level, you understand those services, the standard OpenStack services, and how Trove builds on top of them. The one interesting thing here is the compute instance up top. Nova, gives you compu oh, Nova uses, compu uses guest images and spins up compute instances. Um, 
a Trove guest image is slightly different from a Nova standard guest image. Okay, do you move on? Next one. And this picture kind of shows you that distinction again. Um, on the left hand side, if you will, the database agnostic components. These components work for all data stores, whether it's MySQL or Mongo or Postgres or Cassandra, these are common. On the other hand, if you came along and requested a Postgres instance, which is now supported, that guest instance is going to be Postgres specific. So there's a guest image which has some operating system. Let's say it has Ubuntu on it. And it has Postgres installed. But it also has that Trove guest agent, which is a Trove specific component. Realize that the Trove API is a common API no, lo no matter what data store you have. There's an API which says create an instance. There's an API which says take a backup. But the way in which you spawn Postgres is different from the way in which you spawn MySQL. The guest agent is the thing which understands the distinction. And the guest agent is specific to the database. So you have a Postgres guest agent and a MySQL guest agent. And you install that on your, what appears to be like a Nova image, but now it's a Trove image. The distinction is a Nova image just has an operating system, may have a database on it. A Trove image also has a Trove guest agent. And the Trove guest agent talks to the rest of Trove over a message bus. Very high level architecture-ish kind of thing. Does that make sense? I see a couple of people nodding, but everybody else seems to be like, it's lunchtime already. No? OK. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, all of the stuff in there is in the image, correct. So that thing there, the green box, is, is the image which is going to be spun up based on, or is the instance that is going to be spun up based on an image which is sitting in glands, okay? This, if you will, is the end result. Are we necessarily distributing all of that stuff? Potentially not. Um, there could be, on that guest image, sufficient code which says, the first time I boot, go get me the database from somewhere. And that might be some local PPA which you have in your uh, organization. That might be some other licensed database which we're not allowed to distribute. But we distribute images. HP distributes images. We don't necessarily have to bake all the software onto the image. Does that answer your question? OK. Um, standard keystone authentication. And again, good point. Database authentication different from Trove authentication. The database user, the one which your application uses, that's something which you set up. In MySQL, you'd say create user. Very different from the admin user who potentially is setting up your Trove image or spawning your instance. I saw another hand up there. Yep. Yes, they do. Yep. Um, you could probably talk at some point about your deployment in practice where you do that. Or do you want to do that now? No, um, we, we can talk after okay. the session too, so. Only anybody with a specific set of privileges can delete the instance. But you really don't want to go and delete the Nova instance from under the covers. That's really a Nova instance. You, you could, you, it's exposed, if you have, if you, have you know, um, credentials to go shoot the instance from Nova, absolutely you could do that. Not recommend it. Uh, your mileage will vary if you do that, but it's possible. Um, you should hold that question to futures because very shortly you will be able to do that. Uh, I'm sorry, the question is can you provision a Galera cluster using Trove? Um, Nikhil's going to be talking about what is currently supported and what the futures are. So, 
Okay. So now that I've convinced all of you that you should absolutely try Trove, I have to tell you where to get it. Okay. Um, Trove has a couple of pieces. There's the CLI, which you have to get separately. There's Trove itself, which you have to get. The first two tell you where to get it. Git clone, you're off to the races. If you're looking for blueprints and other things, uh, specs, what we're planning to work on, the third one. Um, and I told you that you need to have guest images. There's a project called Trove Integration, which has all the piece parts for you to build a guest image. There's standard guest images which are available. Um, and if you want production-ready guest images, contact me after the presentation. I'll tell you where to get them. Oh, great question. So Trove was uh, released in Icehouse um, and now available in Juno. There's a significant bunch of improvements in Juno, so I would recommend you use Juno. Um, but if you want to use Icehouse, sure, possible. If you happen to use Havana and you want to use Trove, we're not covering it in this presentation, but talk to any of us after the presentation. It's perfectly doable. Um, but Icehouse or Juno are the official answers. OK. Um, so I just want to end and pass it over to Nikhil by talking a little bit about modularity in Trove. So Trove works with any data store. Works with MySQL, Postgres, uh, Mongo, Cassandra, Couch, relational, non-relational. I'm playing with a graph database. So how do you do all this? And the important thing to understand is we do it using strategies. Um, so now that the previous slide showed you how to get the source, once you get it, you'll notice that there's a directory called guest agent, which is all the data store specific stuff. And you'll notice there's a folder called strategies. And I'm going to talk about how we do backup, because a MySQL backup is very different from a Mongo backup. So under strategies, you notice there's a folder called backup. OK? Well, you go into backup, and you notice there's actually an implementation for each of the backups. So MySQL has an implementation there, as does Postgres, as does Couch. So Let's look at what MySQL does. OK. So there's three actual implementations of backup. The first two effectively do full backup, and the third one does incremental backup. Now, when you deploy Trove, there's a config file which says, when I do full backup, what do I do? You probably set it to you know, backup ex, which means when you go hit the button and you say, give me a full backup, that's the actual method which gets called. Now, what this means is if tomorrow I want to implement a new database, and support it in Trove, there's a small set of things which I have to do. And one of them is implement backup. So I'd have a, if I had a new database, let me look around for a person here, OK, Oracle. Oracle implementation.py is going to be a file in there. And that's going to have a mechanism to do Oracle backup. That way, there's no change to the, to the Trove core code. There's an implementation of a guest agent, and you added support for a new database. We do the same kind of thing. Of course, you do it for backup. You must do it for restore. But you do the same thing for various capabilities. And that's how you make Trove easy to extend to other databases. I think that's about the point where I hand it over to you. OK, so Nikhil's going to show you how all this stuff works in practice. <coughs> and I'll Thank you, Amit. Um, so I just wanted to uh, let you guys know a couple of uh, points on how you can get started with Trove. So if you're a Trove user, you could, there's a couple of distributions um, that um, Tesora and HP ship. And you can go uh, grab a hold of those, the HP um, uh, Helion dev platform uh, or the Tesora DBAS platform. If you're a Trove developer, um, uh, we talked about this a bit earlier, but there's the Trove integration scripts repo that you can git clone. And then uh, there's a sort of overall uh, utility called RedStack that wraps DevStack and will take care of installing Trove on top of DevStack. But if you're interested in what's going on under the covers, you could install Trove just using DevStack without actually using RedStack. Uh, you just have to add the enabled services to local RC. And um, just one caveat there is make sure that you enable Swift as well, because Trove uses Swift for backup and restore. Um, so here's where I wanted to sort of dig in and give you guys a, a little bit hands-on demo of uh, actually going through and provisioning an instance with Trove. So um, just a minute while I bring that up.
Okay, so here I have uh, an installation of Trove on top of DevStack. Uh, can folks see that, or does it need to be a bit bigger at the back? It's good? Okay, so um, just talking a bit about the, the, the create workflow, uh, for cr cr create Trove has the concept, just like Nova, of flavors. Um, and so to create a Trove instance, what you need to specify is you need to specify the flavor ID of the instance you're creating and um, the size of the instance you're creating. And the size basically corresponds to the size of the Cinder volume that we use to store the data store specific files on. So um, for Trove, if we actually do uh, flavor list, you can actually see the list of flavors that Trove supports. And over here, let's go ahead and create a, an instance uh, called test, or let's call it something more original. Trove in kilo. Uh, and flavor two and size one. Let's run that. And as you can see, we get back um, thing. The instance takes a while to build, a few minutes. So um, it's, you can see the status. It's in build. And you can actually see your list of Trove instances. Over here, you'll see I have two instances, um, the, the one Trove and Kilo that I just created. That's in build status. And then I also have a pre-created Trove instance that's active. So. Yes. So uh, very good question. Um, so wanted to talk their optional parameters. As you can see here, uh, there's parameters that you can pass in, which tell it uh, the data store type and version. So right now, without anything, you specify a default data store type. And I have the default data store type set to MySQL and 5.5. But you can also pass in um, what other data store images type uh, type of images that you have created. So if you wanted Mongo, you could say Mongo uh, and the version. A um, couple of other optional parameters. We support AZs if you have them set up in Nova using the availability zone uh, option. And um, we also support Neutron. Uh, and you can pass in the dash dash nick option along with the network ID or port ID or um, the actual IP. So, so. You can look at that by just doing a trove help on any of the particular thing, and it will tell you what the, the optional parameters that you can pass in are. Some of the other optional parameters that you can pass in are uh, if you want your database to be pre-created with the certain uh, databases on there or certain users on there, you can pass that in as well. Um, and then there's these other couple of parameters called configuration or replica off, and I'll, I'll come to them. So. So that was the basic create workflow. Um, any questions on that? Go ahead. Uh, so you get back an IP, which is part of the connect string through which you can access the database. Uh, you don't have SSH, or you don't have access. So let me take that back. Depending on the, the deployment, use, deployers could choose to give you access or not. Um, like in a dev stack where you're setting everything up, of course, you could configure it so that you have access. You can SSH onto the box and whatnot. But most production deploy, deployments of Trove that I know of just give you back the connect string. Uh, and uh, don't really give you SSH access to a database. That, um, so, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in, in a couple of slides later. So, um, Just wanted to talk a bit about, once you have this database now, some of the Trove operations that you can do on the database. And so what, what Trove, how Trove helps you manage this database. Um, some things that you can do is you can resize your flavor. This under the covers uses Nova resize. So, you created a database that was too small. Now you need more memory, more compute power. Uh, you can issue a Trove resize that will then uh, do a Nova resize, and you have a bigger database. You can resize the volume. 
Uh, so if you, your cinder volume is uh, not enough for your data store size, um, go ahead, resize your volume, and now you have a bigger volume. Um, there's also some data store specific extensions that uh, we've implemented, um, and you got to see some of these as optional parameters to create before. Uh, so you can pass in or calls to create specific databases on your Trove instance and create users on your Trove instances uh, or grant permissions. And then um, if you want to manage your uh, database offline using whatever data store methodology uh, the data store supports, you can enable a root user and then use that root user to create other users and other databases. So quickly show that. So if we do a Trove list, you can see the Trove and Kilo instance is now active. We could do a Trove root enable. And that gives you back a root with uh, a root password. So if everything went well, actually, I'm not key. sure what the connect string <coughs> is. So. Okay. If I get the password we had gotten earlier, there we go. We have access to our database. Um, and this is the root user, and we can use, use it to do whatever you want. Um, uh, I want to talk a bit about what Trove is doing under the covers here when you're actually setting up your, your database instance. Um, so when, you're, when the guest agent comes up and when, uh, say, the MySQL instance in this case is being provisioned, uh, Trove is doing a few things. Um, it sets up sane defaults. For MySQL, we set up uh, InnoDB only, uh, and we disable load, load data in file and select into out file. Um, Trove also basically goes ahead and tunes your database for um, its configuration based on whatever flavor size that you specified. So you have the ability to specify different configurations based on different flavors. So for example, your max connections might be much larger if you're using a larger flavor um, or your buffer pool size and things like that. So the, the guest agent goes, goes ahead and tunes all of that depending on the flavors and what you've set up. Um, we also, Trove also has an API called the Config Groups API, and that was one of the optional parameters that you saw earlier, uh, where you can target specific uh, configurations to specific instances and groups of configurations to specific instances. Uh, where this is useful is, for example, if you wanted to change the default character set on a particular database or, or anything that um, you could change in my.conf, you can do that programmatically via the API as well. So apart from Tuning via flavor, you could do that separately via the API. Any questions before we move on to the next slide? Um, other things that are going on, so the guest agent is also sort of securing the, um, the data store instance underneath. Uh, we remove the anonymous user, we remove non-local host users, other than the ones that you programmatically create via the API. Um, we remove local file access, mangled root password, um, and also, um, so we set up security groups in Nova, and depending on um, the, the data store type, the actual security group port is configured correctly for the data store type. Um, you can set up default rules for your data store instance if you want it to be accessed only to a certain IP range, and then you can also create, uh, change that IP range programmatically via the API. So Trove does expose a security groups API that allows you to do that. Um, user SSH access, I think somebody mentioned this earlier, talked about this earlier, is not required. So all of your management happens through the Trove API, so you're, you're free to turn off SSH access. Um, if you're a Trove developer, for debugging reasons, you might not want to do this on your dev stack box, so you can go SSH onto the Trove guest agent and check the guest agent logs and things like that. But in most Trove 
uh, production de deployments that I've seen, uh, SSH access is turned off, and everyone sort of either uses the database through the connection string or uses the Trove API to manage the, the data store. Yes. Um, wanted to give you guys a quick uh, demo of uh, backup and restore as well. So if we go back to the screen here. Um, so we have two instances right now, Trove and Kilo, um, and we can create a backup for that particular instance. And the command there is just backup create. So if you look at Trove help backup create, it takes uh, the instance ID and the name as parameters, and optionally it can take a description and a parent. Um, so the description is just any description that it makes sense to you to tag that backup with. And the parent is, in case Amrit showed the incremental backup strategy er earlier, if there's an incremental backup strategy defined for that data store type, um, and you're trying to uh, create an incremental backup based on a different, a previous backup, that's where you'd specify it uh, with, through the parent parameter. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and create a backup here. Create backup. Backup create. Oh, sorry. And call it backup. And there you go, it says uh, status new, so it kicks off the backup. So this is actually talking to the guest agent and kicking off the backup. Um, so it, it happened quite quickly here because our, our database doesn't have very much info in there. But um, what, what you'd notice happening is you'd notice the instance going into a different state. Instead of active, it goes into the state called backup. And if you list your backups by doing a trove backup list, you'll see that um, a new backup shows up in the state called new. Um, the backup is already done, so it's already in uh, completed, the completed state. Um, and so I already had a backup that was pre-created. So as we had mentioned earlier, what this is doing is talking to the guest agent, kicking off the backup strategy, and then the, this, the files that are created as part of that backup get streamed to Swift, where it then gets stored in Swift. So since this is DevStack, um, Swift is on the same box, and I can actually look at Swift to see what's there. And you'll see there's a, a container called database backups, which is where we store the backups. If you look there, you'll notice that there's a bunch of files corresponding to the backups that are uh, streamed and gzipped and, and, and optionally encrypted as well. So. Um, Depending on the, your config file options in, in, in Trove, you can uh, specify different types of encryption um, and different keys and things like that. So, um, if you'll, no you'll notice that the actual backup file corresponds to the backup ID that was created. So if you look at the two different backup files that we have, um, that one is the pre-created backup, and that one is the actual um, backup in Kilo that we created. Um, I al already talked about the optional parameters that we have. Um, so you can create the description using a description, and you can use incremental backups using parent. Um, wanted to talk a bit about uh, what's going on under the covers. And so backups in Trove are fully managed. They're triggered and tracked through the API. Uh, as I mentioned, they're streamed th to Swift, uh, which is the object storage. And then we do support multiple formats per data store. So for MySQL, we support extra backup and MySQL dump. Um, and um, there's, as we're going further and further, the different types of data stores, including NoSQL ones, uh, we're adding support for backups in each one of those as well. Um, so this is coming to the exciting part, stuff that we've been working in, on in Juno. Uh, in Juno, we added support for replication. Um, and so what you can do in, Ju in Juno Trove is you could say, create an instance, 
uh, but set it up as a replica of a different Trove instance. So um, basically, under the covers, what Trove does there, and this, this is for MySQL, so it sets up a MySQL slave instance using the, the instance that you specify as the master. Um, later on, if your master goes down, you can manually detach that slave and promote it uh, using the Trove update detach replica source command. Um, but um, this, this is all programmatic in a way, and in Kilo, we're looking at trying to figure out a way to actually make this so that you could do some sort of achieve auto failover scenarios and things like that. But replicas are, are important, not just from failover or HA standpoint, but also for read scale out and things like that. So um, they already do exist in Juno. So, how are we doing on time? I can demo a replication as well. Uh, let me take questions, though, if folks have any questions before that. Okay. Good point. Somebody so here speaks from experience on that. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Any questions? How about we start up there? Does Trove handle upgrades of minor, workums, minor versions of the database? Um, no. Currently, Trove doesn't do any upgrades by itself. Uh, there's um, work that we've, we've had discussions of uh, trying to figure out whether Trove should get into upgrading minor versions or upgrading databases it by themselves. Today, what folks do usually is publish a different image and then uh, tell folks to do a backup and restore to the, the other image right, of a different data store type at a different version. But um, there, there have been some discussions about Trove getting into database upgrades as well, but as of today, it does not do any. I had a hand somewhere up here in the middle. Yep, go ahead. Does Trove have its, its own what? Sorry, say it again. OK. Does it have its own resource typing? OK. Um, so. Trove today supports two different modes of operation. It supports um, either creating the instances by calling the native OpenStack services themselves. So uh, if you configure, have that option switched on in the config file, it will talk to Nova separately. It will talk to Cinder separately. Um, and and to, to provision the instance, um, so there's a Trove task manager piece that actually does this and orchestrates that. Or you could tr turn on heat support, in which case it just goes through heat. Uh, we've published templates for the different data store types, heat templates, um, that tr and that's configurable as well. So Trove uses that to talk to heat to actually get your uh, instance up and running as part of a heat stack. So Give me one Let second. Let me kick you, this you off. Had, you had a question up here in the front. So the, vol the backup and restore that we do is not based on the volume, right? So we're actually using backup and restore tools to do the backup and restore. So if you look at the backup strategies that we have, uh, we could either do a logical backup using MySQL dump or um, an actual backup using Inno Backup EX, which is a tool that Percona built that um, actually at the MySQL level gets the files, streams them to Swift. Um, and so the, your actual data on the volume is not actually being touched. That said, there's nothing that prevents anyone from building a strategy that's a volume backup that sort of works across data stores. Um, but you'd have to think about quiescing the database so that when you take a snapshot of your volume, it's consistent, right? So at the end of the day, the backup is, is only going to be of your data. It's not of the metadata on the instance. Um, that is an excellent question. So if I understand the question correctly, it was, what's the current 
list of data stores and versions that Trove supports. Um, there is a wiki page uh, that I can uh, provide you guys the link for. So it depends on what you actually configure for that particular deployment. This deployment has MySQL 5.5 as the only data store configured because it's on one single VM that's running, right? So um, depending on, so in order to get another data support, another data store version, what you'd need to do is create the images for those guest agents uh, and having that particular data store or having a way to go fetch that data store in that image and then say, telling Trove using a register API that this data store corresponds to this image and this version. And so Trove is extensible that way. So, um, so may maybe one other thing to add. Just the names, not the versions. MySQL, including MySQL, MariaDB, Percona, um, Postgres, MongoDB, Cassandra, Couch, Redis, Postgres. That's we, we said Postgres twice. Oh, but said post okay. <laughs> That's the complete list of all the data stores which are currently supported. Each one is supported to a different level, if you will. For example, we know that replication is now supported with MySQL and, and variants thereof. Clustering is supported. Sharding is supported with Mongo. But we're working on rationalizing that thing and coming up with the full support. Um, you could run Trove in a container, for example. But if you run Trove in a container, some of the capabilities are not going to be available in the container, like resizing, things like that. So it's really a combination of where are you going to be running the data store, what data store version do you have, and what do you actually want to do? That's the full matrix. That's why there's a wiki page for it. So yes, there is an API that Trove supports. That's the resize volume API. So in case your volume is insufficient for whatever reason, you can um, you can issue the resize volume, and then it will change the volume size underneath it using Cinder. So it will call Cinder to do that. It might be a little long to do it as a demo, but we can definitely do it after. Yeah. Okay. So. Can you talk to the integration with thermometer for metering as, as well as general monitoring how you would go about doing that? Um, sure, great question. So today we do not actually integrate with thermometer for monitoring. It's something that we've been talking about, and there's a design session on it. Um, uh, we do have uh, notifications for uh, metering. Uh, so there's config values that for rabbit queues that you can turn on by specifying the name of the rabbit queue. So when instances do get created and deleted, it will drop messages into that queue, specifying that that particular instance got created and, and deleted. Um, for monitoring the guest agent themselves, uh, the Trove uses heartbeats. Uh, so the guest agent code actually has, uh, depending on which manager for which data store you deploy, has logic which checks on the data store, makes sure it's up and running, and then sends a heartbeat back to the component called the Trove conductor, which says, hey, this data store on this particular guest instance is up and it's running. Um, so it, when you see, when you do a Trove list and look at, you see the word active there, which means that the data store is up and running. If the data store goes down for whatever reason, you'll, the status will go to shutdown. And you could use that for monitoring to build out, um, say, things like failover. Um, but uh, there's nothing automatically that happens today based on that. And we're talking about doing some automation there as well. Um, yes, so if you're using heat separately, you can use heat to auto scale. Um, I specifically have, haven't looked into that much, so I don't have very much experience with that. So, Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so great question. The question was, are there any tools to help building the, the guest images? So we use Disk Image Builder, which is a triple O tool to actually do the best the build the guest images. Uh, if you go to the Trove integration repository, which the link was posted earlier and clone that, you'll see elements for each of the data store types that we support. And so all, all you have to do is Trove kickstart data store type. That will actually build that particular image and register the image in your Trove local deployment so that you can then go ahead and, and test it out. So. And that will also leave the image around for you. So if you want to pick it up and move it somewhere else, you can use it. If you want to get 
some other custom images. Happy to help you with that. Um, also, to dovetail to the other gentleman's question about monitoring, we do have images which have other monitoring things baked onto them. So if you want to use those. Uh, quickly to fast forward, since we're running out of time, uh, something we added support for in Juno uh, is clusters. We only support MongoDB clusters. Uh, and um, the, the call is pretty similar. It's cluster create data store type data store version. And uh, the, the actual creation of the clusters creates shards. And you can actually, su uh, we support scaling that out horizontally through a, an add shards API call action. Um, but before um, we're done, I also wanted to just mention uh, what we've completed apart from that in Juno and what we're planning for Kilo. So, um, Apart from replication clusters, we added support for, for Neutron and Postgres. Uh, we added support for uh, some, some enhancements to configuration groups, like configuration groups for MongoDB. So these are basically the, the parameters for the data store that you can tune via the API. Um, backups for Cassandra and Couchbase and Tempest tests. Um, but the interesting pieces that we're looking for help with and where more developers can sort of um, jump on or design stuff is planned for Kilo. We're, we're planning to build out clusters and cluster support, including uh, support for Galera clusters, synchronous MySQL clusters. Um, uh, some of that monitoring and failover support for re replication. Um, associating flavors with data store types. So if you're deploying Mongo and you want to make sure your Mongo instances only get as attached to these particular flavors, support for that. Um, accessing the data store logs via the API. So for example, you have a MySQL instance and you want to check the slow query log to diagnose why certain queries are taking a long time, how to do that programmatically via the API. Um, and then some bo uh, housekeeping work with removing deprecated Oslo code and, and upgrade testing using Grenade. Um, that said, that's not a finalized list. Um, if you have an idea how to make Trove better, uh, please come talk to us, uh, work, with it, uh, work with us on it, and we're always looking for feedback and folks to come along and, and, and help us out. So um, that's pretty much we're growing uh, community and find us on uh, uh, IRC hashtag, so not hashtag, hash OpenStack Trove on Freenode. So. Thank you all for um, sitting through this. And any questions, more than happy to take them now. Or, or even if you want to talk to us after the, the session is over, come find us. And more than happy to talk about Trove. Well, if you, if you have specific questions for Nikhil, I think he's going to be at the Genius Bar in the HP booth later today. Is yes. That, is it, sorry, they call but it Genius uh, Bar or something else. No, sorry. Uh, but that, that, uh, that said, I, I'm willing to talk about yeah. anything other than Trove as well. Um, uh, at, at any point of time, so just come Buy him me. a beer and he'll do that. <laughs> Buy me two beers. <laughs> Be clear about stuff, right? Question. Any other questions? Go ahead. Does it work with SQL Server, Oracle, and DB2? The answer to two of those is I have them up and running, and to the third, not yet. Um, the community versions, I, the community uh, version currently doesn't have it. We're talking about how to do that right now. Uh, so currently, as of Juno Trove, we don't have image elements or anything to build those, so we don't support it by, by far. There's work in progress to to support some of that. So, um, and and Amrit's been working on that, so he's he's the probably the right person to talk to in that regard. Yes, so if you do a Trove show, and maybe I glossed over this a bit earlier, it, it gives you some very basic information about like how much, inf uh, how much your volume, volume is being used and things like that. But apart from that, Trove doesn't really care about the data plane as much. So let me just show you that. If I take that instance and do a Trove show. 0.13 is yeah. the volume so used. So 0.13 gigabyte is the volume used, and the volume size is 1. Um, but um, other than that, like we don't really care about the data plane. So in order to take 
talk to the database. Um, you can use MySQL directly. And Trove really is more of a provisioning and management tool and doesn't want to get into um, the, the data layer at all. So. so if you were using MySQL in this case, you can always run MySQL admin 10.0.0.3 status. And you'll get, you'll get whatever you need. And the same kind of command for any other database. Uh, but not much more through Trove, I guess. Yeah, so, so there, there have been, it's, it's a great question, and there has been some discussion around getting some of the MySQL stats through Trove as well. Sort of like, hey, what's my replication lag now that we have replicas? What's, mm -hmm. uh, how's, uh, what's the health of my, my, my MySQL database? Uh, we, that's not there in Trove today. Uh, it's, it's sort of minimal, but we're still talking about trying to build that out. So, great question. Go ahead. <laughs> well, funny thing you should mention that. Yes, we do. We do. And um, if, if you install Trove and you get this pane called database, where I created a bunch of oh, database instances in a different tenant. That's what the reason why it doesn't show up. But there you go. Those are the databases that we just created up and running. You can create backups from here. You can do your resizes, restarts. And then if you go to backups, you can actually see the backups that you have and do restores. <coughs> so we do have support. Uh, we added support recently for uh, s replication to Horizon as well. And as, as we go along, we're, we're adding support for a lot of the new features that, that are coming up. So we're fully integrated with Horizon. Go ahead. Uh, so this is a great question. It's, the question is, the, the actual I guest agents, do they re get... Um, so uh, it's not really request response because they're getting messages through AMQP, but uh, is that over the, a separate management network or is it over the same customer network? So in, 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 Trove, Neutron, in Trove deployments that I've seen on Neutron, it's always been on a separate management network where the guest agents are talking to the the Trove AMQP server just to separate out um, and the, the network access, right? And the other question is, the other aspect of that is that when you create a Trove instance, the customer can also specify a NIC to what other network his instance is attached to. Um, and so we really don't control that very, very much. So we do create, uh, so I've seen Trove instances actually talk to the Rabbit, ser the Rabbit or AMQP servers on a separate management network. And that's usually how you deploy it. But um, that said, it's really up to the deployer who is deploying the Trove deployment to come up with that architecture and that piece and figure out how those pieces are working together. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's on a separate management network precisely for, for that reason, right? So It's configurable on a separate management network. Uh, yes, so uh, this w that's time. So if folks, uh, uh, I know it's lunchtime, want to leave, please, please feel free. Uh, I, I'm going to be here taking more questions. So um, maybe I'll come down and get de-miked, and we can talk about it a bit more. So thank you all for coming. I uh, hope you had an informative session about Trove.